G'day Grifters! It seems you've found your way to the Grift Code channel and another installment of the Dora project. In this video, we're going to be hitting a massive milestone for Dora and wrapping up the build of the full casting deck, made completely custom and from scratch. It's been a long time coming and very exciting, so if you haven't had a chance to look at some of the previous build videos, it's worth having a look at those after this one. Previously, we have built the rear deck, front deck and raised aluminium floor. This video directly follows on from the live world tank build, as we'll be using it as a structural component of the deck build. With the live well installed, the plan is to build three adjacent hatches that attach from the bench seat up to the front console. Like always, there's no time to waste, so let's get into it. The majority of the framework was constructed using 3mm by 25mm aluminium angle. This is relatively inexpensive and particularly easy to weld for a noob like me. The side frames, however, also use a 40 by 20 channel on the outside edge to provide an internal vertical face to make mounting the hinge easier. As has been the aim for most of the project, I have designed the system to be removable and modular. And because of this, much of the framing was intended to be bolted together in small manageable sections. You could certainly substitute the bolting methods I'm using for welding or riveting directly to the boat and frame if that's more your style. To support the outside edge of the framing to the boat, I extended a small arm to directly contact the vertical rib. A return was added to the arm to create a flange that a bolt could pass through and pick up a rift nut within the rib. For those that are new to the build series, the floor, the front deck and rear deck have been finished using aluminium panels. This mid deck is no different and we will be using 3mm sheet to make the hatch panels. With one frame completed, the other side came together very quickly with the build pattern essentially mirrored. The starboard side frame extended underneath the side console. This was an expected frustration, but the design was optimised so that vertical supports could attach to the existing floor trusses. After all, the console should be easy to move a little later, but for now, we need to move onto the prime real estate, the centre hatch. Unsurprisingly, the frame construction followed a similar suit to the sides. 45 degree mitre cut extrusions make for very easy square frames, but more importantly, a flat join for a flush mounted top panel. There's definitely more intricate framing techniques that utilize channels to assist with water sealing and drainage, but it was honestly a little beyond my skill set, and Dora just isn't that fancy to deserve that level of effort. After test fitting the center frame, it showed the starboard side frame was short by about 5 to 6 millimeters. It's just my luck, as I don't know how to stretch an extrusion by that much. Instead, I removed the frame and cut the inside section out, and cut a new section of extrusion 5 millimeters longer to weld back into place. I hope you don't mind me showing you my stuff ups, because obviously I make a few, but I share them with you to show that it's only natural. And there's plenty of ways to circumvent issues with some creativity. Never be daunted about getting your hands dirty because experience is something you don't get until just after you need it. Anyway, give me your thoughts in the comments if you'd rather I cut out my stuff ups and show you just the glossy good bits. With the new extrusion welded back into place, the frame went back into position and slotted together millimeter perfect. While I was still piecing together the frame modules, I was using self-tapping screws to hold the pieces in position. Not only are they easier to install, but the holes required are much smaller and adjustments could be made relatively easily if necessary. I used small off-cut sections of the sheet metal to level all the components so the top surface was flush with the bench seat panel. With the perimeter of the frame secured in place, the upright supports could be measured and welded in. Each hatch module would have two vertical supports on the outer corners, mounting directly to the floor trusses using the same 25mm angle extrusion. I'm so glad I've bought myself a TIG welder, as I think it's so much more forgiving than a misdrilled hole and poorly set rivet. And who would have guessed I would need all the forgiveness in the boat building world. Thankfully, the oversized supports are an easy fix when you have the circular saw at the ready as well. 
I remember someone said in my last video about measuring twice and cutting once. Couldn't possibly have been me, but seems to be reasonable words to live by. With a correctly sized frame squeezed tightly between the outer frames and into position, it was possible to secure the uprights into the floor trusses temporarily. I'm sure many of you may be questioning why this is a temporary solution. My logic is that if I'm likely to remove the frame modules, it's possible to over-torque and strip the self-tapped threads in the soft aluminium. Rift nuts would provide a more permanent solution, but that's for later in the video. After the mess of tools have been cleared, I can show you a clear view of the frame. From this, it may be more obvious of how and why the life well tank is a structural component to the deck. The next steps revolve around covering the deck in alley sheet. This sheet is the remains of what was used for the front deck, a 1200 by 2400 3mm sheet. The panels were measured directly from the frame with consideration of the thickness of hinges and necessary gaps. I am still wildly in love with the cordless circular saw for cutting these deck panels as there's no way I could replicate the same results using a jigsaw. Though this saw is specific to metal cutting, I'd imagine you can get a very similar result with a regular wood saw with a metal cutting blade. They can make a mess though, so it's best to clean up just so you can see what you need to do. Uh, <clears throat> you know what to do. I mentioned in the previous live weld build video that I needed to add an additional perimeter to the live weld tank. This video shows that the flex of the panel at the front isn't ideal and extra support wouldn't go astray. Unbolting the live weld tank and the center hatch module was pretty effortless. After marking up the 45 degree cut needed, I heed the advice given to me about not cutting alley with an abrasive wheel. Long story short, you shouldn't use an abrasive wheel as the aluminium is soft and gums up quickly or worse, jams and shatters the disc. I purchased a diamond edge blade designed for aluminium and used copious amounts of WD-40 to lubricate the cut. A hacksaw probably would have done the job, but power tools are fun, so why not? A new length of extrusion was cut to length and welded to the inside lip of the tank, completing a full return lip perimeter using 25mm extrusion. A flush top surface is necessary for my hatch lid to sit flat and to ensure a good and mostly watertight seal to the live well. As the panel goes back in place, it's very noticeable to see the benefit of the added bearing surface. With this same logic in mind, I decided to add additional welded platforms to the side frames with small gaps in between to provide a mounting surface for the stainless steel hinges. I'm sure I sound like a broken record, but being able to remove these modules from the boat and work on them on the bench and out of the boat makes life so much easier. I am still so far from being a good welder, so being in a good position to weld is so important for decent results. Now I'd like to say I consistently had results like this, but that's just not the case. With the side module mostly complete, I could begin setting roof nuts in place to secure the frame. I've been mostly leaning towards using the countersunk aluminium roof nuts because they ensure the frame can seat flush against the surfaces without any unsightly gaps, as well as less likelihood of flexing and bowing. After the side panels were secured, it was time to consider how to mount the hinges for the centre hatch. If I'm honest with you though, I had somewhat snookered myself. I was forced to have the hinges slip between the frame and the light well tank as I couldn't foresee any way of mounting the hinge without the hinge being exposed or the edge of the hatch interfering with other panels. To set the hinge in place, I marked the position of the hinges evenly spaced out of the boat. After pilot marking the holes, I could mount the frame, drill through the live well, tap the holes and feed the hinge between the live well and the frame to secure the frame and the hinge with an M4 screw. A little too complicated, right? If I had my time again, I'd try my best to source continuous plastic hinge, but this is still holding up perfectly well and the hinge is mostly invisible from the top surface. Thankfully, the front hatch hinges could be mounted in a much more orthodox way, though again, one of the hinge arms needs to be slipped behind the back of the live well. I mention this as the thickness of the two hinge systems pushed the rear edge of the framework out by a couple of millimeters undoing some of the hard work we made to get everything all flush and square. The thought had crossed my mind to reshorten the rear center module, but time was passing quickly 
and with the boat in this state, it couldn't get out and onto the water. Persevering ahead, these hinges were riveted into position using stainless rivets with a healthy coating of Tef gel between the stainless steel and the aluminium to minimise galvanic corrosion. I definitely prefer Tef gel over Duralac these days as it's much easier to work with. Time to put the modules back together. The rear centre hatch is secured to the floor trusses, with the front edge going back through the mounting holes for the hinges. The process is a little fiddly lining up six M4 holes, but with a bit of patience it's not too bad at all. All of the rib nuts and the tap connections were also protected using Tef gel, so hopefully we won't have too many problems in the future. With the summer days flying past, I enlisted my brother to help me churn through mounting the side modules. The side modules secured themselves to the midsections using rib nuts, as you might expect. With all the panels tied together from front to rear and left to right, the system quickly became incredibly strong for its lightweight construction, while still being removable and modular. To fix the hatches to the deck, I used a similar principle to the previous videos, whereby I drilled and tapped the sheet panels to house M4 fasteners. This way, the panels could be removed and reinstalled once a deck covering is laid over the top. Because the hinge lays flat onto the inside frame surface, I needed to use countersunk fasteners to make sure when the hatch was closed, the head of any screw didn't interfere with the frame. Now that the hatch is swinging away on the hinge, it's apparent that the console is a little too close to the bow. I knew this was bound to happen, but now with everything in place, it was easy to measure the exact measurements needed to move the console back while still keeping enough room to sit comfortably behind the steering wheel. The console is secured to the gunnel with two M6 bolts, so re-drilling two holes 20mm forward of the old holes in the console gives us enough room to clear the hatch opening. Unfortunately, I had to remove my Burley Pro side bros, but I'll replace this somewhere in the boat soon, as it's such a handy little pocket. Securing the hinges to the side modules was a little tricky trying to ensure they were set at the right height. To do this, we made a basic jig which allowed us to spot drill the rivet locations going into the frame. If the hinge was set incorrectly, the hatch panel would either not open or not sit flush with the other panels. After spot drilling the locations, the holes could be drilled to final size to receive the stainless steel rivets holding the hinge in place. The side modules have a large gap underneath the gunnel, and I'll save you the templating process because we've touched on that quite a few times. I wanted to try cutting a complex profile like this using the angle grinder instead of the jigsaw as the jigsaw is a bit of a pain in the ass when setting it up properly. The angle grinder with the diamond wheel was as straightforward as you might expect, but it definitely benefited from some WD-40 lubrication. I couldn't say the final result was any better than the jigsaw, just that the process was a little faster to get an equitable result. Beside the floor panels, these side skirts are the only panels with fasteners securing them from the top. The reason being, I couldn't set a rift nut into the sheet panel and pull it into the frame the same way as the other designs as the frame uses an open channel. If you can think of any ways of how else I could have made a removable panel without fasteners through the top, let me know in the comments as I was so tapped of any new ideas. When I cut the EVA foam, I will need to leave some small holes to access these fasteners. Now that all the top surfaces are secured, I needed to skin the vertical faces with a kick panel. I purchased a half sheet of 1.5mm alley as this wasn't a structural wall. I toed and froed for some time deciding whether I cut them into three sections or two, but landed on separate sections so the modules could all be removed if the need arose, kick panel included. The panels were riveted into place with countersunk aluminium rivets. I had planned on using pinch weld around all of the edges, but unfortunately with the COVID outbreak, pinch weld ended up being quite challenging to find as it's used extensively on point of sale shields. In any case, a quick kick proved it was indeed a kick panel. Up to the last structural component, the console support. Now with our new raised floor, the old console wall lifted the console up far too high into the air to be reused. And more importantly, 
I had a new welder that needed to be used, so I desperately required a different solution. Armed with a bevel gauge and a protractor, I could draw out a sketch of what the panel could look like. Whilst the console looks fairly square, everything sat at unusual angles. The front faced angled backwards, and the underside had an upward kick at the rear of the console. I figured that with the casting deck superstructure being close to the console, I should leverage the structure so I could minimize the overall size of the console support. Instead of mounting to the floor, the support would act as a gusset securing into the rear face of the casting deck. Not only does this make the piece smaller, but also opens up the footwell to be a little more comfortable to stretch the legs. The outer surface of the gusset made use of remaining 3mm sheet stock, and return walls were cut from 3mm, 25mm wide flat bar. The perimeter walls of the gusset provides an adjacent face to connect the console to the gusset and the gusset to the deck. Now I got a little overexcited at the prospect of lots of welding, and in that giddiness I managed to tack the frame together to the wrong side of the sheet stock. I'm not sure what I was thinking when this happened, but I realised I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed sometimes. Thankfully, Dremels are pretty sharp, and I could undo my mistake and tack it all into the correct position. But that said, it was really rewarding to see the flat pattern against the console matching the shape perfectly. I made some pretty beefy welds to the inside of this box structure to make sure that there was enough material to be linished, flush and smooth to match the finish of the console. Though it would be possible to mount the gusset directly to the thin kick panel, it's not something I would be willing to trust. Instead, I cut another extrusion to place on the inside of the frame to distribute the load of the console into the floor truss and the frame structure. Though I used rift nuts in these shots, they didn't last long as I needed some vertical adjustment to level out the console. Oh, we're getting close folks, I can feel it. Just like the front and rear deck build, I'm using the same hatch latches, but this time I'm going to show you the step I always forget to film. Because the alley sheet is so thin, a spacer shim is needed to fill the gap left in the latch stack. Using 4mm sheet remnants, I can cut a small spacer shim and rivet it into the alley panel to effectively double the sheet panel thickness. This way, the latch is much more secure. Without the shim, it's possible for the latch to float up and down and rattle in place. As I won't need to remove these shims, I rivet them into place from the top surface and repeat the process for all three hatches. This is by no means a waterproof casting deck and was never intended to be but it is possible to limit water ingress by adding a soft foam tape between the hatch lid and the frame. The slight thickness of the foam also provides a small amount of pretension to the hatch, which minimizes rattling and metal to metal contact when you're hauling ass down the estuary. The final step is to install the center kick panel into position, sans pinch weld, as well as securing the console gusset through the kick panel to the vertical upright. The best way I found to secure it at the perfect height was to use my car scissor jack. Elevating the console slowly until it was level with the deck and then cinching everything up with stainless M6 hardware and nylock nuts. And that's how I pieced together a totally custom, home-built, aluminium, lightweight, bass boat inspired, super awesome and functional casting deck. What a wild ride. Like usual, I'll get to the cost of the build in just a second, but I'm going to ask a favor. If this video has helped you out, or you found it entertaining, please consider liking the video and leaving a comment. And back to the cost. I'm going to use Bunnings prices for this, so there's every chance you can find this stuff cheaper. For all the extrusions, it's about 160 bucks. Five latches, 70 bucks. 12 stainless hinges, 120 bucks. Aluminium sheet stock, a combined total of the 1.5mm sheet and 3mm sheet, roughly 230 bucks. I used hardware that I've been collecting for the build, but let's rough that in at 25 bucks for a grand total of $600. Not expensive, but not the cheapest build either. But hopefully one that should last the lifetime of the boat and hundreds upon thousands of millions of enormous fish 
that I'm bound to catch. And what a segue, because in the next video, we're going to be plumbing that life well tank that we've got in the center of the deck. The life well is going to boast both an aerated inlet and a recirculation system that can also pump the water out of the tank. Why I need that, you'll have to just subscribe and suss out the next video. Until then, take it easy, and I look forward to chatting with you in the next Dora project installment on the Grift Code channel. See ya.